Chris Bukowski for Emerging Civil War. I'm standing at the location where James Longstreet was wounded in the wilderness by his own men on May 6th, 1864. It's a complicated story and it's a little confusing, so I'm going to walk you through the town and show you some of the features that explain this wounding. A little loud here next to the road. I'm standing next to the Orange Plank Road here and you can see uh, lots of cars going by. Wilderness not too wild these days. I'm going to step into the woods, get away from the loud traffic, and talk to you a little bit more about what happened here. Through the magic of technology, I'm going to jump into the forest here just a little bit. The waysides I was standing by just a moment ago is still behind me there. The parking area stretches to that car right there. That's my vehicle and I wanted to show you how small the parking area is just a couple of spots and I always like to point that out because uh, if you notice the wounding Stonewall Jackson which took place in May of 1863 just a year earlier than James Longstreet's wounding at the wounding, uh, wilderness the wounding of Stonewall Jackson gets its own visitor center and a big huge parking lot and daily tours during the summer uh, Longstreet gets 30 minute parking and there's room for uh, maybe four cars there or a bus but Longstreet's wounding is, I think, far more consequential for Robert E. Lee than Jackson's was at the time. In fact, Jackson's wounding, when it happened in the middle of Chancellorsville, is probably the best thing that could have happened to Lee at the time because the army there was separated, divided in two with a big, angry, wounded Union army in between. Jackson had wanted to maybe try to cut off the Federals from U.S. Ford, but he had two... Uh, I mean, he had one exhausted division as reserves, plus two that were sort of played out. And he was going to be going into the maw of the 5th and 1st Corps, both fresh. Um, I'd also have to skirt uh, elements of the 3rd uh, Corps as he was doing so. So, um, numbers there not looking so good. His wounding causes the whole action on that end of the field to take a time out. And it allows Re Ali to reevaluate his situation there, bring in Jeb Stewart, an experienced commander, who reevaluates things on the ground and then decides to change the game plan to reconnect with Lee and resume the battle in an entirely different way on May 3rd than Jackson had intended. So Jackson's wounding there, big time out. It's gonna have huge repercussions of the command structure, but it's um, really important at that moment in time for things to really get uh, kind of uh, reset for Lee. Uh, Jackson's winning allows that to happen. Here at the wilderness, Longstreet has come in on the morning of May 6th at the exact right place at the exact right time with the entire right flank of the Confederate Army in shambles and disarray, falling back through these woods into that direction behind me, pushed by an intense attack by Winfield Scott Hancock's 2nd Corps. And Longstreet shows up and just starts hammering. Boom, boom, boom. And Hancock, by that point, has lost a lot of his cohesion and strength. So he reels back, coming from that direction this way now. And Longstreet just hammering and hammering and hammering. And when uh, Hancock's men are finally able to set up a defense, which they set up through this area, we're standing in this uh, tour stop, is right kind of in the middle of Hancock's defensive line as he's trying to, uh, to uh, uh, um, collect himself and put up some sort of defense against uh, Longstreet's push from that direction. The Brock Road is that way, about 300 yards from where I'm standing. The Orange Plank Road behind me, this is sort of the axis of advance for the Confederates pushing this way. Hancock is making his stand here, and so what Longstreet decides to do is he's gonna try to outflank Hancock. Off in that direction, about 100 yards, is an unfinished railroad bed. And uh, Longstreet's gonna send his chief of staff, Moxley Sorrell, to lead um, uh, uh, Billy Mahone's uh, brigade off in that direction. He's gonna have Wofford's brigade going off in that direction. And they're gonna try to outflank Hancock. Uh, one of the little things of irony I like to point out, Billy Mahone, uh, prior to the war, had been an engineer and he helped lay out this railroad. Didn't get uh, any uh, return on his investment and work at that point, but then he gets it here on this day on May 6th as his men are able to use that unfinished railroad cut to help get into position. And they're going to charge this way into Hancock's flank, completely throwing Hancock's men off guard. It's going to crush uh, Hancock's flank and they're going to fall back now in that direction toward the Brock Road. I've got myself turned around in 180 degrees here so far. Longstreet is gonna push this way, even as remnants of his flank attack are gonna come in on the side. So he's got these simultaneous uh, 
attacks, smashing attacks, just devastating in their power, driving the Federals back. So here's where things get confusing because Hancock, uh, as he falls back, he's going to try to, you know, to form around the Brock Road, Plank Road intersection and protect that vital spot. We'll take a look there in just a second. Longstreet is going to come from my rear and try to hit Hancock again before Hancock has the time to reform. So let's walk through this ground now and take a look at uh, some of the features that make this such a complicated story to really unwrap. But I'm standing at the Longstreet wounding site now next to the Orange Plank Road. Longstreet is leading a column from behind me in this direction. He's had smashing success. Hancock's men have been driven from this spot to the intersection of the Brock Road, Orange Plank Road, which is in that direction. Let me turn around so you can head or see it in that direction. We're going to head there in just a second. And as Longstreet is looking now to follow up his attack with another attack, he's leading fresh troops in this direction getting ready to deploy them here for a push. These are troops that are wearing brand new uniforms, and so they are dark charcoal gray. That's gonna be important because in a few minutes, some of Mahone's men are gonna see those Confederates in those dark uniforms and mistake them for Yankees. Now, as Longstreet's coming in this direction, he gets into this area, even as Mahone's scattered regiments start to coalesce around this very spot. Earlier, the 12th Virginia had passed across the road in that direction. We're gonna see in just a second that they go through a dip, which makes them invisible to anybody who's up here. Okay, so I have moved through the woods about 100 yards or so toward the Brock Road intersection. I'm just off the plank road, which you can see behind me as a point of reference. And I'm in a low ground. You can see there's a rise behind me in that direction and off toward the federal position the uh, ground rises behind me there. This dip is really important in the story of Longstreet's wounding, and it really helped kind of puzzle things out for me. Uh, when I first read the account, Chris White and I together were trying to figure this out, uh, because uh, as we read the account, it talked about Longstreet getting shot through the neck and passing out by his right shoulder blade, or behind his right shoulder blade. So the angle, the trajectory, and the elevation of the shot made it really difficult to understand. And so somebody had to be kind of shooting a little uphill, and uh, why is that all happening? And so it didn't make sense based on just looking at the maps and, and the, the, the wounding set itself. So as we got pounding around out in these woods, we discovered this indentation and how it matches up with the story of the 12th Virginia. The 12th Virginia is holding the right flank of Billy Mahone's advance and they're coming from this direction. The railroad cut is behind me. Again, uh, a little over 100 yards or so, uh, uh, maybe uh, closer to 150 yards by this point. They're advancing in this direction. And as they do, they find a forest fire that they have to veer around, and that separates them from the rest of Mahone's brigade. So that's gonna leave the 41st Virginia as the right anchor of Mahone's brigade, as the 12th kind of veers off into this direction, down into the slow ground. Now the wilderness today is pretty deceiving because if you look, you can see the trees are pretty tall. There's a lot of wide open space as I walk down here through the forest from Longstreet's wounding site up in that direction. Not a problem at all to get here. But remember, in the 155 plus years since the battle, this forest has had the chance to grow and mature. And so these tall trees that we see above us do a lot to blot out the sunlight and kill a lot of the ground cover. This was a second, third growth forest at the time of the war. So the foliage was dense, thick, choking, hard to move through, but there was still a lot of leaf cover on the ground. And that leaf cover caught fire in the course of the battle. There are some 12 or 13 different forest fires through the wilderness over the course of the battle. So that's one reason why the 12th Virginia has to navigate through this wilderness and down into this ditch is to get rid, uh, get around one of those forest fires. So as they get down into this depression and they begin to advance toward the road, they look across the plank road and can see fleeing Federals who are still on the retreat from this flank attack. And so they decide to pursue across the plank road. The thickness of the wilderness keeps them from seeing whether they still have close contact 
with the 41st on their left flank or not. As it turns out, they don't. As they got around that forest fire, they lost complete contact with the 41st. To reestablish it, but they do reestablish contact with those Federals, and so they are going to push across. I'm going to try to do the same because we've got a very unique perspective from down there that shows why the 12th is able to get across without being seen. So here I am right next to the road. Let's see if I can do this without getting killed. Uh, Long Street again coming from that direction. The 12th Virginia coming from that direction. And the Federals have fallen back to that direction. You probably can't see it too well on the video, but the orange plank road and the black road intersection is right up there, 100 yards from where I'm standing. Easy range for anybody who's up there to shoot at Federals, or for, uh, shoot, to shoot at Confederates who are down here. But because of this dip, we are masked from that intersection. You can't really even see the uh, the street signs that are up there. But we're really close. Able to pass under the noses of Hancock's reforming men. Likewise, as the Confederates are trying to reform and get ready to push in this direction, they can't see us either. We can't see the long street wounding stop sign, uh, stop up there, the tour stop up there, because we're down in this depression. It looks like it's clear. We're gonna go. Cross, 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 going after some Federals in this direction, and we've done it. Uh, nobody saw us in either direction. We're on the far side of the road. We've got Federals back here uh, trying to offer some sort of resistance, but for the most part fleeing. So as the 12th Virginia forms up and tries to push, they realize that, hey, nobody crossed this road with us. So we are alone. And as they get down in here, you can see that this topography drops off further. So that's going to put the 12th Virginia on a downhill slope. And they realize as they're separated, they need to get back to civilization, make connection with the rest of their brigade, find the rest of the Confederate Army. And what they do is they wheel around through this forest to try to realign themselves with the road. After they finish their wheel and come back up toward the road, they're coming uphill. And they're doing so even as Longstreet and his new column with those dark clad new uniforms start coming through. And the 12th Virginia trapped out here, having been uh, already in pursuit of Federals, thinks that Longstreet's column is a column of Federals. And they're going to see that as an enemy, but they're also going to see it as an opportunity. They've got the drop on these guys, and they're going to open fire. Just to give you a little context, I'm now toward the Longstreet wounding site again. You can see that dip pretty clearly. That's the dip we just crossed. That's where the 12th Virginia crossed. The Brock Road, Plank Road intersection just down there. If we turn in this direction, we'll see the Longstreet wounding site right up there past the car. You can see the little corner of my car. I'm standing at the driveway of Forest Walk, and uh, this is part of the uh, Lake Wilderness development. And as you look down there, you can see the downhill slope. So when the 12th Virginia is wheeling in this picture from right to left, they're getting themselves into position to come back up. You can see they've got an uphill slope that they've got to climb in order to get back here to the road. I'm uh, just opposite the side of the road from the Longstreet wounding site, looking toward that dip in the road we've been talking about. Watch this truck disappear down in there and he will vanish from view. So that's why the uh, 12th Virginia is able to kind of slip by there undiscovered. All right, I'm opposite the Longstreet wounding site and I have visuals of my battlefield buddy, Maxwell James Mikowski coming out here. Maxwell James, can you say hello? Where'd he go? See, he's sneaking up behind me. Look at that, sneaking up behind me. Can you say hello? Hello. Say happy wilderness day. Happy wilderness day. You having fun in the battlefield? Yes. Yes. So Maxwell's gonna wander back over there to his mother. And uh, I'll uh, finish Oriana's here. You can see the orange plank row behind us, Longstreet's wounding site. Um, just beyond, I may be uh, 55, 60 yards into the woods. So the 12th Virginia coming up from behind me, coming up that ground, gets to this area just as they pop up over the hill. They see Longstreet's column coming from that direction to this direction on the orange plank road. And you can see how hard it is even here to make anything out to the uh, to the roads. Well, imagine how thick the forest was at the time. They just see movement, dark uniforms, they open up. Longstreet, by this point, unsuspecting, feeling great, ready to launch yet another pounding attack. Meanwhile, Mah the rest of Mahone's brigade has reformed. They're coming to the road from the opposite side. 
the 41st Virginia, who we're talking about holding the right flank of Mahone's position. They see this fire. They think it's directed at them, so they fire back. And so Longstreet's columns really caught in this crossfire, mistaken identity, and Longstreet shot through the neck and out through the right shoulder. He's a big man, but one witness said he was literally just lifted up out of his horse with the force of the impact. Starts bleeding profusely, uh, and it's going to be a huge shock to everybody. As I'd mentioned earlier, one of the things that flummoxed me was the angle of Longstreet's wounding. And because the 12th Virginia is coming from downhill, shooting up a slope, they're aiming high. And so that would kind of catch Longstreet in the neck and kind of come out his shoulder, um, particularly because they're shooting from his left side toward his right. Uh, Joseph Kershaw, one of uh, Longstreet's division commanders, is actually going to ride into the melee and start yelling, friends! And, and people will finally realize what's going on, and they will stop. One of Longstreet's brigadiers, Mike uh, Jenkins, is going to will be shot. Um, he will be mortally wounded. He won't die right of way. Delirium, he'll actually be cheering out for his men, but he's got a severe head wound. It's going to take him a little while to die. Uh, it's going to be devastating. This takes place at about 1230 in the afternoon. It's going to take Lee personally to come to this section of the field and reorganize things. The senior division commander, Charles Field, isn't quite uh, prepared to take over. And so that's why Lee's got to personally supervise. And that loss of time is going to give the Federals in that direction, a couple hundred yards, a valuable time to reform. Hancock's going to put in a, a defense in depth, three lines of earthworks um, that are going to allow him to eventually repel the attack that will come from this area uh, by four o'clock in the afternoon. And so uh, that, that valuable time is going to really be what Hancock needs in order to survive the day. And that's going to end fighting on this end of the field. So really at the peak of the action, at the moment of crisis, as Longstreet is hammering away at the uh, Federals, he's taken out of the action, completely deflating all Confederate momentum here. Uh, and that's why that moment in the battle where he's wounded is so much more critical to Lee uh, on the negative than Jackson was in the moment of battle uh, as at uh, Chancellorsville a year before. I'm Chris Bukowski out here in the forest with my battlefield buddy Maxwell James. Say hello. Hello. Thank you so much for joining us here at Emerging Civil War.